I'll do my opening gambit and we'll let some people um, arrive um, if and when. So a very warm welcome to our special festive edition of the Crime, Justice and Security Network sessions. Um, we've got a very special guest today. We've got Mark Wood, who's a senior lecturer at Deakin University in Melbourne. Mark's specialisms are digital, social media, online, cyber realms, which he elegantly, I think, puts as technology harm relations. He's also uh, published on uh, quite prolifically on media, crime prevention and policing. But tonight, in keeping with the focus of the group, we're going to be looking at Mark's um, contributions to critical realism and crime, and particularly his three articles published in 2019, 2020 and 2021 in the Journal of Theoretical and Philosophical Criminology, the British Journal of Criminology and the Continental Thought and Theory Journal, where he's taken on ultra realism. So um, as usual, the us usual format will be Mark speaking, and then we'll be followed by a, a Q&A. So happy to hand it over to you now, Mark. Thanks uh, so much, Orlando, and thanks for inviting me as well. And can I just also say, I think this, this group is fantastic. I wish we had something similar in, a, in Australia as well. So um, as Orlando has said, I've been invited to present on three articles I've written with a couple of uh, co-authors in two cases critiquing the, I think, quite ambitious theoretical perspective of ultra-realism, which really seeks to establish a new epistemological and ontological foundation for criminological research. So for those of you who aren't you know, overly familiar with ultra-realism and, and what it entails, it is underpinned by the psychoanalytic theories of Jacques Lacan, Slavoj Žižek, though its proponents also do claim that they building on the ontological and epistemological principles of critical realism, or to be more precise, some of those key, key principles. Um, really, they're, they're primarily building on Bascar's work in a realist um, theory of science. Now, ultra-realism, as I said, stands out for, I think, some of its quite ambitious goals in criminology. As I say, it's, it's seeking to establish a new ontological and epistemological worldview for research, you know, addressing, as they put it, some of the shortcomings in constructionist and post-structuralist and critical realist perspectives. Now, ultra-realism actually positions itself occasionally as a bit of an improved version of critical realism. And this is something that I contend, this is a, a framing I contend in one of my articles on a couple of different fronts. And I'll delve into what I think is some of the misalignments between ultra-realism and some of the fundamental tenets of critical realism and explore some of the incompatibilities between the two. Now, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I join you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, as the traditional custodians of all of the unceded lands, skies and waterways I live and work on at Deakin. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and to their emerging leaders. Now, I begin with a, a bit of a confession. Uh, so I used to be, uh, in my undergrad and honours years, a big proponent of Lacanian psychoanalysis. You know, way back in the day, I even wrote my honours thesis on Lacanian psychoanalytic thought. Uh, so there's a picture of the front cover of my uh, honours thesis with the, I think, very cringe title from gang member as analyze and to psychoanalysis as evaluand, evaluating the synthetic potential of Lacanian psychoanalytic theory and gang masculinities research. So I undertook my Bachelor of Arts and my honours and PhD at a very, very uh, post-structuralist criminology discipline, so the, the University of Melbourne, where there are a number of, of Lacanians and Deleuzeans and Foucauldians. Um, and in my undergrad years, you know, Lacanian psychoanalysis kind of stood out as the, the most promising of those post-structuralist perspectives at the time. So, you know, Lacan's seminars and accretes, you know, were a really big formative part of my intellectual development. Um, and I still do think there were some really great ideas contained in those really deeply unreadable seminars of Lacan's. But by the end of my honours years, I'd started to have some really serious reservations about Lacanian psychoanalytic theory, as well as Zizek's kind of rejuvenated version of Lacan and blending with, with Hegel. 
And then I think it was probably in the, the second year of my PhD, I read Archer's Realist Social Theory and so many things kind of seemed to, to click to me. Um, and the more I read in, into critical realist scholarship, as I read Sayer and Eldervast and Biscar, I started to develop more of a vocabulary for, I think, articulating a number of the problems that I had with Lacan's framework. And then one of my, one of the first honours students that I supervised as a, as a post-doc um, at the University of Melbourne undertook a Lacanian analysis for their thesis and a really fantastic analysis as well. And I kept coming across the work of this duo, Hall and Winlow, when I started, when I was reading my, my students' work. Now, of course, I'd encountered Hall and Winlow and their, their ultra-realism before I started supervising this honour student. Um, but one of the things that stood out for me initially about their work was that they wanted to kind of blend and synthesise Lacanian psychoanalytic theory or Zizekian theory um, with critical realism. So these were, you know, the two really key theoretical frameworks for me up until that point. And so this got me interested. And so I did a bit of a deep dive into their work to see, I guess, how they reconciled all of these major incongruencies between Zizek and Biscar. And whilst there were some elements of their work that I found quite compelling, there were, I was kind of frustrated, I think, by some of the inaccurate representations and straw manning of critical realism that they engaged in as well. So with my background in Lacanian psychoanalytic theory as well, I felt that they didn't really address some of the big ontological and epistemological contradictions between critical realism and Lacanian or Zizekian theory. I also thought there were these big contradictions between, I guess, some of the assumptions underlying Hall's work on pseudo-pacification and the conceptualization of psychoanalytic drives that their transcendental materialist framework drew upon. And I thought there were bits of their framework that were essentially a, a bit incoherent. And so I did some, some research to see if anyone else had made, made the same critiques of ultra-realism um, kind of from a critical realist perspective. And at the time I'd found that, that no, nobody had offered these critiques and in fact, there was very little evaluation or critical evaluation of ultra-realism in the literature. So as a bit of a side project, I started writing down my ideas, thinking that I'd publish uh, a single critique. Um, but there ended up being so much material that uh, I had to divide it into two articles. And I brought on a couple of co-authors, um, Imogen Richards and Bryony Anderson, for two of them. Uh, and unsurprisingly, when the second of these articles was published, uh, a number of the critical realists, oh, sorry, the ultra realists, I should say, weren't too impressed. Uh, two of them published a reply to our uh, British Journal of Criminology piece, um, which we in turn replied to. And so today I'm, I'm going to discuss, I guess, only just a few of the critiques of ultra realism that I level in these articles. So I'm going to focus primarily on critiques that relate to either what I see to be some of the incongruencies between ultra-realism and critical realism, um, as well as some of the critiques that I make that draw explicitly on critical realist theory. Now, before I dive into these critiques, it's important to explain exactly what ultra-realism is and what its key contributions are. And to do that, I think it's worth going back to and directly quoting and drawing upon some of the work of ultra-realists themselves, which I'm going to do throughout this presentation. So what are the key characteristics of ultra-realism? So ultra-realists assert, firstly, that existing criminological paradigms fall short in comprehensively addressing the motives behind harmful actions. They challenge notions of innate selfishness, repressed goodness, social learning, flexible sociolinguistic construction and positive ideological hegemony, as they put it. Ultra-realists posit that harm is not solely a product of social inequality. Instead, they argue that social inequality is a consequence of ruthless individuals and groups perpetrating multiple harms to outcompete, to dispossess and to politically disempower others. And this is the result of a culture of competitive subjectivity that's fostered by a history of successful accumulation. And this is a product of, of um, pseudo-pacification and the capitalist system. 
And this transcends class boundaries and it seeps into various micro relations throughout the social structure. Now, whilst influenced by critical realism, ultra realism distinguishes itself by challenging the conceptualization of the relationship between, as they put it, nature, the individual, and the social. And to be more specific, they have, you know, particular bee in their bonnet around Margaret Archer's analytic dualism. And I'll hopefully get some time to return to their, their critique of that, which I think misses the mark. Um, but essentially, Hall and Winlow argue that Archer's analytic dualism separates, as they put it, the individual moral agent from the system's structures and dynamic processes, which I, I, I think is a misreading, um, to put it lightly, of, of Archer's framework, which is about analytic as opposed to ontological dualism. So ultra-realism instead builds on Johnson's transcendental materialism, which is really a kind of uh, attempt at kind of uh, systematizing Zizek's ontology and big corpus of work into a coherent system. And they use this to theorize the emergence and the constitution of subjectivity. So they draw upon Lacanian insights to emphasize, as they put it, the elemental force of absence, you know, this symbolic void, as they put it, at the core of the emerging subject. And this void propels the subject outward, compelling them to seek a coherent symbolic order to alleviate, to use Lacanian terms, the terror of the reals, unknown stimuli. Humans, asserts Johnson, are hardwired for plasticity. And so to really dig into the, into the foundations of critical, sorry, of ultra realism, you need to understand some of the kind of core concepts at the heart of Lacanian psychoanalytic theory. So Johnson's ontological standpoint really does form the bedrock of the ultra realist perspective in, in several ways. As Hall posits, the perspective introduces innovative ways of contemplating ideology and subjectivity. And this is rooted in a profound encounter with the Lacanian real. And I'll explain what Lacan is kind of getting at by the real in a minute and, and later on in my presentation as well. But essentially it's underscoring the individual's pursuit of a coherent symbolic order that is driven by a compelling need for comprehensibility and coherence. And this conceptual framework, as I said, draws really heavily on the insights of Jacques Lacan and the philosopher Slavoj Žižek, specifically emphasizing two really pivotal concepts. And these are the symbolic order and the real order. So Lacan's symbolic order, put simply, refers to the, the realm of language and symbols and cultural norms that shape our understanding of reality. It represents this network of, of linguistic structures and shared meanings that mediate our perception of the world. So in this order, individuals acquire a sense of identity and meaning through language and through societal conventions. So the symbolic order, it's, it's crucial to shaping social norms, roles, and the intricate web of signifiers that structure our subjective experience. It kind of acts as this framework through which individuals navigate their existence within the broader societal context. Now, contrasting with the symbolic order, Lacan's real order is a more elusive and I think a more challenging concept. The real doesn't conform to linguistic or symbolic representation. It represents the unmediated or raw and often unsettling aspects that elude language. The real encompasses these experiences that resist symbolization, such as intense emotions, traumatic events, and the profound aspects of existence that just cannot be captured through language. It stands beyond the symbolic constructs that shape our understanding, constituting a dimension of reality that exceeds our attempts to represent or articulate it. So within the context of ultra-realism, the symbolic order and the real order play a crucial role in understanding subjectivity and ideology. You know, the symbolic order is grounded in, in language and cultural constructs and contributes to the formation of societal norms and individual identities. Simultaneously, the real order represents the unfiltered and the raw experiences that escape easy categorization and expression. So ultra-realism, you know, really heavily influenced by these Lacanian insights, 
emphasizes the impact of neoliberalism on subjectivity, arguing that harmful subjectivities are shaped by both symbolic constructs and unmediated encounters with the real. And this kind of dialectic between the symbolic and the real orders forms the basis for comprehending how societal structures and raw, unfiltered experiences intertwine in the shaping of individual and collective identities. So at the core of ultra-realism's crime causation theory is the notion that psychosocial conditions that are generated by neoliberal capitalism are inherently criminogenic. So according to Hall, these conditions give rise to various forms of illegal entrepreneurship, you know, surpassing the traditional boundaries of social crime that's motivated by a sense of injustice. So the contention that crime is an expression of, of neoliberalism rather than the utilization of, of kind of um, transcendental materialism has been the bit of ultra realism that's faced perhaps the most criticism. And I'll kind of talk about that in a, in a minute. So here's how Hall puts it in his own world, words. So the fundamental psychosocial conditions that are constituted and produced or reproduced by neoliberal capitalism and are inexorably criminogenic insofar as they tend to generate a cluster of illegal entrepreneurial forms that have shifted the norm far beyond the social crime traditionally motivated by a sense of social injustice. But what I want to kind of focus on firstly uh, some of the irreconcilabilities or incongruencies that I see between the transcendental materialism that uh, ultra-realists kind of um, hang their, their hook on and critical realist or critical realism's ontology and epistemology. And I argue in line with critical realists that Zizek's framework, or I should say Johnson's kind of reworking of Zizek, involves an epistemic fallacy which ultimately reduces ontological questions to epistemological ones. And this fallacy really you know, extends throughout Johnson's transcendental materialism through to ultra-realism, which it draws upon, which ultra-realism you know, draws upon. So the heart of ultra-realism's transcendental materialism uh, and the epistemic fallacy it contains uh, is you know, suggested by Hall and Winlow back in a 2015 publication, you know, the, the kind of key uh, culmination of, of ultra-realism in a, in a book entitled Revitalizing Criminological Theory Towards a New Ultra-Realism. So what they suggest in this kind of key tract that I'm about to reference is that the forces and the processes in the intransitive realm, while seemingly independent of our knowledge, are at a deeper level products of actions constantly made unconscious. And as I'll suggest, this raises concerns about reducing ontological questions to the epistemic realm. So here's the, the quote in, in question. I think this, this sums up a, a, a kind of approach to applying a transcendental materialist uh, model of ontology and epistemology on top of Bascar's work on the distinction between transitive and intransitive realms. So as Hall and Winlow put it, transcendental materialism goes a step further than the other realist positions as it lays out the basis for a thorough psychosocial investigation of the so-called intransitive realm. Transcendental materialism's fundamental insight is that although the forces and the processes in the intransitive realm seem to act independently of our knowledge and activity, this realm is at the very deepest level a product of the accumulation of the systemic consequences of actions that are constantly and systematically made unconscious. We really know about these actions, but we constantly deny or dismiss them as we perform them. And so I want to suggest this view poses several challenges for ultra-realism. Uh, and I'll get into a couple of them a little bit more, a little bit later as well. But I think firstly, it commits an epistemic fallacy by reducing questions of ontology to the epistemic issue of how we know and understand being. Second, the argument collapses Biscard's domains of the empirical and the real. It implies that individuals unconsciously already know the true causes underpinning events, but they suppress them into their unconscious, which actually, I think, reinstates either a form of idealism or a form of empiricism. 
contra Pascal. Now, furthermore, the transcendental materialism that's underpinning ultra-realism faces challenges when its proponents argue that Lacan's conception of the real is more useful than Pascal's for capturing the forces shaping human action. And this is an argument that um, several of its key proponents have made several times. And this claim, as we'll explore, highlights, I think, a deeper contradiction in ultra-realism's epistemology. So Lacan's real isn't, I should note, the external world of objects. It is, as they, you know, Lacanians would put it, the impossible that dislocates reality from within. Zizek has, has argued several times that the Lacanian real is strictly internal to the symbolic, and this makes it inaccessible to us. And this poses a methodological challenge as it really offers no clear pathway to fallible knowledge about the intransitive world. So in adopting the Lacanian model of subjectivity, and Johnson's transcendental materialism. Johnson and Hall and Winlow by extension align with what Crotty has termed a subjectivist epistemology. So unlike constructivist epistemologies where meaning emerges from the interplay between object and subject, subjectivist epistemologies posit that the subject imposes meaning on an object or that that meaning comes from elsewhere in the form of discourse. So subjectivist epistemologies are often associated with structuralist and post-structuralist and, and post-modern perspectives, which emphasize the role of discourse in generating meaning. So in Lacan, Zizek and Johnson's terms, meaning is imported from the symbolic order and placed onto objects, highlighting the subject's role in, in shaping meaning. Now Zizek acknowledges that the Lacanian real's inaccessibility and states that attempts to kind of seize it result in antimonies, as he would put it. And he emphasizes that reaching the object in itself is achieved not through seeing through epistemological distortions, but by transposing those obstacles into the thing itself. And there's actually a really, you know, Zizek doesn't refer to Bascar very often. I've only encountered, I think, one reference to, to Bascar's work in Zizek, but it's on this precise point that, um, that Zizek is referring to his work. He's making this real distinction between how they approach um, knowledge of, of objects. And you know, the argument being that uh, if you're you know, approaching things from a Lacanian or Zizekian perspective, you know, meaning is imported from the symbolic order onto objects. And you know, we can't see through uh, these epistemological distortions. We actually need to just you know, import meaning from elsewhere to understand the world. So another uh, number of scholars have noted that common references to reality refer to the symbolic as the Lacanian real is not accessible according to Zizek and Lacan's framework. But this poses some pretty severe methodological challenges for ultra-realism. So whilst Biscar's critical realist framework offers a route to uh, more accurate transitive accounts of reality, Lacanian theory lacks such a pathway to fallible knowledge, as it argues that there is this split between the symbolic and an unknowable real. So it's kind of unmooring of the transitive realm from tra intransitive objects. And in doing so, this results in, as uh, critical realists would put it, judgmental relativism. You know, ultra realism is at its core, or I should say, the epistemological and ontological assumptions that it makes are riven through with judgmental relativism. Yeah, it lacks the capacity to judge one account of crime or harm or sociality as more accurate than another. And it fails to explain the formation of new transitive accounts of knowledge beyond traumatic encounters with the Lacanian real. So in contrast to critical realism's emphasis on scrutinizing and refining causal mechanisms, Hall and Winlow's model isn't you know, inspired by uh, Zizek isn't necessarily subject or capable of being subjected to the same scrutiny. So that's my first kind of key criticism of, of ultra-realism from a, from a critical realist perspective, that it is at its core underpinned by or characterized by a, um, a kind of a judgmental relativism. The second key critique that I make, and this kind of flows through two of the, or actually I should say all three of the articles, 
is that at its core, it is offering a kind of totalizing discourse on the causes of harm. And this is something that, that I'd say most existing critiques of ultra-realism have centered on. You know, they've centered on its, its crime causation or its harm causation theory, um, which has occasionally been uh, characterized as or labeled as one-dimensional. And I'll explain, I think, using Sayers um, concepts, why I think um, that's quite an accurate characterization of it. And specifically, I'm going to draw here on Sayers argument uh, against both totalizing discourses and postmodern analyses that kind of treat society as a centerless web of heterogeneous relationships. So totalizing discourses, in essence, are theories that attempt to I guess, explain all social relations and behaviors through a single key concept or structure. So while associated with post-structuralist critiques of Marxian perspectives, critical realists, including Sayers, also reject totalizing discourses as reductionist. You know, critical realism, as Sayer points out, tries to find this middle ground, acknowledging a plurality of potential modes of domination and autonomous ideological power centers. And some of these centers may be more relevant or activated in certain situations or actual events, as opposed to others. In certain situations, they may remain dormant. So Sayer succinctly captures, I think, the essence of critical realism here in explaining that it supports the view that certain structures or mechanisms can hold more significance in shaping particular outcomes. You know, because we're in an, in, in an open system and, and causative powers or generative mechanisms aren't always, as a, you know, kind of an actualist would argue, you know, are always um, activated. However, crucially, it does not justify, you know, assuming a single center. It's recognizing that what is central or most important depends on the context and the phenomena under consideration. And this acknowledgement of a plurality of autonomous power centers within contemporary society is kind of, I argue, notably absent in ultra-realist theory. So building upon Zizek's argument that global capitalism has led to the unprecedented homogenization of today's world, ultra-realism, unfortunately, I think, presents a rather reductive take on the causes of crime. It replaces a centerless web with a totalizing discourse that assumes a singular political economic center as the driving force behind all human behavior. Now, critically, ultra-realism doesn't consider the multiplicity of extra economic processes that might influence identity, beliefs, or behavior. So unlike critical realists who argue for the involvement of various mechanisms kind of working together, ultra-realists contend that harm can be traced back to a political economic center. And in doing so, they often diminish other potential mechanisms, um, including racialization, um, sexuality, and gender as these kind of superficial epiphenomena to political economy. Now, to see how this totalizing discourse unfolds in ultra-realism's kind of key theories, I'm going to turn to an article where my co-authors and I examine two of ultra-realist criminology's central concepts. And these are the breakdown of the pseudo-pacification process and special liberty. Now, in our article, we identify shortcomings related to you know, gender-related disparities in offending, the explanation of violence through Freudian notions of, of drives and libidinal energy. Um, we offer eight critiques of those two theories. Um, but fundamentally, the critiques I'm going to focus on relate to the way in which ultra-realists are conceptualizing psychoanalytic drives and the extent to which they represent a form of, uh, or instantiate, I should say, Archer's notion of downward conflation. So essentially, in, in the second of our three articles, my co-authors and I argue that ultra-realism kind of presents in alignment with Archer's notion of downward conflationism, this direct expression theory of crime, where crime is kind of portrayed as a cynic dosh and a direct unmediated expression of political economic conditions alone. And one thing to kind of note here is that, you know, in, in kind of making the, this critique, you can kind of find this not only in a number of the kind of presuppositions of uh, Hall's pseudo-pacification model and his notion of special liberty, but also in the repeated times where 
um, at least prior to, to publishing uh, this article, ultra realists would often set up this dichotomy where they talk about you know, causative factors and symptom symptomological factors. And when they did so, they'd often, or they'd always say that, you know, there is this, you know, you have causative political economic factors and symptomological non-political economic factors, essentially. Yeah, and this you know, you know, rendering individual action, you know, not only kind of entirely um, or mainly socially determined, but also essentially arguing that all of these non-political economic factors are mere epiphenomena to political economy. They're, they're symptoms of uh, political economy and capitalism, as opposed to having any degree of autonomy from it. And this is, of course, not to argue that um, there isn't this deep intertwinement of these kind of systems of oppression and inequality and the causative powers of these, these factors. What it is to argue is that um, if you're kind of setting up this dichotomy between you know, causative factors and symptomological factors, you are granting those symptomological factors no degree of, of causal autonomy um, from the political economic center. So before we kind of dive into this critique, it's, it's important to actually unpack what precisely uh, Hall and Winlow and uh, proponents of ultra-realism are, are getting at when they're proposing these notions of special liberty and the pseudo-pacification process, or I should say the, the breakdown of that process. So these theories have been developed by Steve Hall over, over many, many years. Um, I think the most uh, kind of substantial uh, systematization of them you know, occurred in, in his 2012 book, I think it would be fair to say. But both of these, these theories or concepts are providing insights into the dynamics of violent crime reduction in capitalist societies. I mean, mainly the um, pseudo-pacification process, I should say, is, is trying to do that. So the pseudo-pacification process, as Hall uh, articulates it, theorizes the shift from physically violent to pseudo-pacified socioeconomic competition. And it's, it's a direct challenge to Elias's civilization process thesis and Mukieli's pacification process thesis. Essentially, it's explaining the decline of violent crime in the 20th century, in, in 20th century capitalist societies. And it's doing so through drawing on Freudian um, psychoanalytic concepts um, and arguing that individuals are pseudo pacified into the socio symbolic norms and practices of capitalism through this kind of process of energizing um, certain you know, drives towards violence and then sublimating that energy into socio symbolic competition. And I'll explain in a minute why I think there are some significant issues with that, uh, with that thesis in a minute. But this pseudo pacification process involves, as I say, the sublimation of aggressive libidinal energy into competitive individualism um, required by capitalism. And Hall describes this as the conversion of physical violence and visceral aggression into economically energized forms of competitive individualism. So to be pseudo pacified is to conform to the rules of capitalism and to adopt competitive behavior. And this process, according to Hall, serves two key functions. You know, firstly, it stimulates socio symbolic competition and consumption. And secondly, it limits physical violence for efficient market function. Now, out of this process emerges what Hall terms special liberty. And this is a sense of entitlement to bring harm to others in the pursuit of individual interests. So the concept arises from ultra realism's uh, reconsideration of how harm is accounted for in criminological theory. Um, it's seen as, or I should say, special liberty is seen as this kind of fantasized state of exception, to quote Hall and it grants individuals the freedom to act with exploitative impunity. Now, critically, special liberty and the pseudo-pacification process are kind of constructed here as two mutually reinforcing processes. So special liberty provides capitalism with subjectivities that are tailored to drive production and consumption, and it encompasses competitive individualism, you know, displays of cultural capital, hedonistic consumption, ruthless capital accumulation, and so forth. Now, according to ultra-realism's kind of proponents, these theories align with 
the frameworks Zizekian transcendental framework, uh, or should say transcendental materialist framework. However, as I argue, this framework emphasizes neuroplasticity. And this is something that really problematizes some of the underlying assumptions contained in, in Hall's model. And particularly, you know, when we when we dig into how the how Hall and how Johnson and Zizek are conceptualizing drives. So this is just a, a quote from Hall that I think sums up, just to um, put it in the in the kind of key scholar's own words. You know, pseudo pacification involves the sublimation and the conversion of physical violence and visceral aggression to an economically energized form of competitive individualism that is fueled by a struggle for social distinction. You know, the energizing of destructive, competitive drives and desires and the concomitant expansion and sophistication of external and internal control measures in relation of mutual amplification. Okay. So the pseudo pacification process is suggesting that both physical violence and socio symbolic competition are underpinned by the same drive, you know, the same Freudian drive. And I will argue that this raises crucial questions that, that warrant a bit of scrutiny here and actually kind of undermine the, the kind of explanatory potential of, of this theory for explaining any degree of reduction of violence in capitalist societies in the 20th century. So my co-authors and I argue that essentially the pseudo pacification process is naturalizing violent drives. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, because I think this is a this is something that uh, a couple of ultra realists have, have contended and said, no, we don't, we're not doing that. We're not naturalizing violent drives. And I'll explain in what sense I, I mean that they're, they're naturalized in a minute and why it's, it's significant for um, undermining some of the explanatory potential of the, of the framework. But essentially what Hall's framework is doing is implying that libidinal energy that's driving into personal violence is merely shifted. It's not transformed. And this contradicts the idea of human plasticity that's emphasized by ultra realism's transcendental materialism. So the core of, of I think, our disagreement with the ultra realists, and in particular with Raymond and Kuldova, who wrote the, the response piece that we in turn uh, responded to, it revolves around two crucial matters. And this is the nature of drives in the psychoanalytic tradition, you know, how you are conceptualizing them, and the principles of, of neuroplasticity. And we maintain that the pseudo pacification process model naturalizes violent drives. And this actually kind of undermines or poses a real challenge to the framework's emphasis on neuroplasticity. So in their response piece, Raymond and Coldover's account of drives kind of presupposes what you can term an energetic conceptual of the conception of the psyche, um, which we argue would contradict the Lacanian understanding of drives. You know, in Lacan's framework, drives are socio-culturally you know, constructed. They aren't biologically pre-configured. So you don't have this kind of pre-existing set of drives that can remain dormant in certain situations or can be energized in others. You know, drives are, are, are a product in Lacan's work of socio, um, of the symbolic order, constructing them. So in Lacan's view, to be, to be more kind of precise here, the drive is composed of four elements. And these are the pressure, the end, the object, and the source. But importantly, the drive is a cultural and symbolic construct. So it's not something that's just kind of, we, we're born with a set of virtual prefigured drives, and then you can kind of sublimate, you know, energy towards certain ends and over others. So Raymond and Coldova, whilst adhering to a Lacanian framework in their discussion of drives, seem to overlook the incongruity between this framework and Hall's presuppositions in the pseudo pacification model. So a fundamental query emerges concerning, I guess, the, as you know, scholars in the Lacanian tradition would put it, the seemingly endogenous nature of drive objects within Hall's model. So in his theorizations of pseudo pacification, Hall is making this assumption that drives are, you know, you have this set of, you know, prefigured drives, you have a you know, drive towards you know, violence that can be energized or um, you know, brought to the fore in certain situations, or it may lay completely dormant in others. But 
importantly, for the model to, to work, I would argue, you need to have that underlying assumption that, you know, there are these kind of existing drives that can either be energized in certain socio symbolic situations and, and lay dormant in others. Now, Johnson, who is the kind of key figure, or one of the key figures that Hall, Winlow, and the ultra realists draw upon, argue that you know, drive objects, so the objects to which a drive is directed, originate exogenously, not endogenously. So in other words, it is socio, the socio-symbolic order that kind of directs our energy or directs our drives towards particular objects. So in other words, towards you know, socio-symbolic competition or towards violence. So drives, in other words, do not have biologically predetermined orientations. You know, the drive object's origin lies outside the individual. But this contradicts the seemingly endogenous nature of drive objects in the pseudo-pacification process. So just to be even more precise, this is how Johnson himself puts it. So drives, unlike instincts, do not have biologically predetermined, innately hardwired orientations towards pre-programmed telloi in the forms of given kinds of objects as natural types of entities or conditions. However, it does not mean that Freud posits the actual existence of a drive without a drive object. So what are the, the kind of implications of this for the pseudo pacification model? So the Lacanian understanding of drives as socio-culturally constituted and devoid of endogenous orientations raises questions about the compatibility of Hall's model with the principles of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity emphasizes the nervous system's ability to respond to intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli by reorganizing its structure. But for this to hold true, drives must be treated not as timeless or as possessing immutable naturalized drive objects. But Hall's model with its seemingly untransformable drives where you know there is this naturalized drive object towards violence doesn't seem to align with this dynamic nature of neuroplasticity so for neuroplasticity to be fully embraced drives as i say can't be treated as you know timeless or possessing a fixed or natural drive object and our skepticism lies in the seeming contradiction between the pseudo pacification model and the key principles of neuroplasticity and the, the model of drives that Johnson and his kind of transcendental materialist framework proposes. And one key implication of Hall and Raymond and Coldover's conceptualization of drives here is that I think creates an even more implausible model of pseudo pacification. You know, so if drives need to be energized and we have all of these latent virtual drives within us, as Raymond and Coldover argue, and some drives can become prominent through being stimulated whilst others remain dormant, then this means that we have to accept that you know, capitalism firstly stimulates a drive for physical violence within us and then immediately sublimates this into socio-symbolic competition. But at the same time, Hall and Winlow argue that the pseudo-pacification process is the result or the product of the need to reduce physical violence within capitalist societies. So there is this kind of contradiction at the heart of the pseudo pacification model. And that's assuming that um, or for it to function or for it to explain why people who had experienced a breakdown in the pseudo pacification process kind of immediately revert or have their energy desublimated into physical violence, you need to start off with that assumption that physical violence is the kind of natural drive object um, that, that's being sublimated into socio symbolic competition. And if you don't do that, then you, you kind of lose the ability to explain reductions in violence uh, in capitalist societies through this model, because people who you know, experience this breakdown of pseudo pacification might you know, end up you know, doing all sorts of things um, except violence. Violence might be one thing that you know, one response to, to that breakdown, but it's just one of many because there is no natural drive object. OK, oh, whoops. Let's talk about the, the, the final critique that I, I have very, very briefly, because I do want to leave you some, some time for, for questions. And I know it's, it's like 10, 15 at night for, for you. But the, the final critique I want to discuss more, draws more directly on critical realist theory. 
Um, and that is that the two concepts that I've discussed so far are, I think, characterized by what Archer terms downward conflation. So ultra-realism, as we've seen, kind of underscores the direct influence on, of capitalism on crime, as expressed by kind of Hall and Winlow's lament that the pervasive acceptance of capitalism not being superseded or controlled has kind of directed critical investigations away from direct human interactions with consumerism and global market capitalism. So they're saying that, you know, we need more criminological scholarship that is looking at these direct interactions with, with consumerism and, and global market capitalism, you know, interactions that aren't um, mediated by culture. And, you know, Hall makes this, you know, very, very direct point that, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, we need to account for uh, these interactions as being mediated by culture is this real, um, real problem that we should kind of avoid that. But in setting up a dichotomy between causative political economic factors and symptomological factors, ultra-realism engages in downward conflationism. And this leaves it unable to explain the formation of the structures that it discusses. And it also treats phenomena like gendered power relations as mere byproducts that have no causative power. So downward conflation you know, is a you know, characteristic of what we term direct expression models of crime, which explain crime as you know, this direct expression of you know, capitalist structures or you know, could be you know, uh, patriarchal structures, for example. It doesn't have to be um, political economic, but it's the idea that there is, you know, one central um, totalizing um, discourse that is able to explain the formation of harmful behavior. Now, proponents of ultra-realism may, and uh, indeed several have, argued that they, they do admit a whole range of causal mechanisms beyond political economy into their, their crime causation theory or into their work more broadly. However, our critique suggests that their statements often kind of counterpose political economic factors as causative and others as symptomological. But more importantly as well, we'd say that there are these kind of contradictions between some of those, uh, those that work that does actually kind of admit that, you know, yes, gender, gender kind of matters here, or, you know, yes, I've examined the relationship between um, codes of masculinity and crime and the actual theories that they draw upon to explain um, that behavior. We'd say that you know there's kind of a bit of a Motten Bailey fallacy happening on occasion, where uh, you know there are these really I think more difficult and um, contestable claims made by Hall in the pseudo pacification model, which really you know is kind of founded on economic functionalism, for example, and some of the more acceptable or defensible claims that are made in the ethnographic work of some of the order of some of the the kind of key authors and proponents within the within the perspective. So there'll be kind of this you know, retreat from um, Hall's more contestable claims around pseudo pacification when someone says, hey, what about what about gender? Um, and, you know, someone will kind of pop up and say, oh, no, look, I've, you know, I've done an ethnography that's that's examined, uh, you know, codes of masculinity and et cetera, et cetera. But then ultimately they'll draw upon a model uh, of pseudo pacification that doesn't account for gender. Um, so that's a kind of repeated I think, uh, approach to defending some of these claims. Um, but essentially, you know, the, the argument that we make in the BJC piece, and I won't kind of harp on for, for too much longer, is that really the, the kind of the two ultra-realist concepts that I've, that I've discussed so far, you know, the, or the main ones, you know, like pseudo-pacification and, and special liberty, kind of really allow um, kind of no breathing room for, for agency at all. And in fact, emergent properties um, and micro level interactions uh, that, that kind of account for the wide range of different factors that can shape people's vocabularies of motive and, and their situational interests and so forth. You know, it all kind of ties everything back to this um, overarching uh, construct of, of pseudo pacification and kind of, you know, it has you know, a degree of monocausality there, um, you know, in that, you know, yes, some of the ethnographic work may say that, oh, you know, on the ground, things are a little bit more uh, complicated and people raised A, B and C, but I'm going to draw upon this model that, that doesn't account for, for any of that. So I think that, that, that is all from, from me. I'd love to hear any, any questions that you have and, and thanks for just sticking around as well. I know it's, it's relatively late at night. So uh, thanks everyone. I'll, any questions?
Well, Mark, if this was in person, I would be standing up and giving you a standing ovation now. Um, that was that was absolutely that was absolutely fantastic uh, Christmas present, Kamali. So uh, thank you very much for giving us that talk.